U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents Dairy in Reality with special guest Ed Graff, National Dairy Commodity Director for the National Farmers Organization, and Don Burkon, Assistant to the NFO Dairy Commodity Department. Here now is Ed Graff. I have a statement that I'd like to read, it came from a leader in the dairy industry. It states, any increase in return to dairymen in general depends eventually upon the closer cooperation between all dairymen. This statement means to me and to other dairy producers that this doesn't mean just cooperation between the dairymen in Wisconsin or Minnesota, or New York, or Idaho, or California, but it means cooperation among dairy farmers in all of the dairy producing states in the United States. Don, I thought this statement from a leader is something that is very important because this is certainly what NFO has advocated for quite some time. Ed, NFO always has known that to be effective in dairy bargaining would require closer cooperation not only among dairy producers but um, among dairy groups as well. And in the early days when NFO was being successful in organizing in primarily the meat and grain producing areas, they had to decide whether or not to extensively organize in the dairy areas. And in 1961, after a thorough analysis of the dairy situation, the NFO reasoned that the majority of the dairy producers were already organized because about 75% of them belonged to dairy cooperatives. They reasoned then that the obvious solution to poor dairy prices was to, the, uh, to form the existing dairy groups into a marketing agency in common. So in 1961, NFO suggested to the industry that they form this marketing agency and a series of meetings were held to get the idea across and to get the dairy groups moving. After these meetings, however, it became clear to NFO that the dairy groups uh, were not going to move on this. Uh, it appeared as though there was lack of leadership in the dairy industry at that time. So NFO decided that they would have to organize the dairy producers and then get after the job of forming the marketing agency in common. Certainly, Don, this is the background and the history really of what actually happened back in the early days. And I think as we're discussing this today, we can realize that there was a misunderstanding of dairy leaders, there was a misunderstanding of dairy producers out there, how this had to come about. I can remember back some of the times, and maybe this is an impression now that some people have, that I think we should get clearly understood that there's a necessity for a bargaining group out here, something that has been lacking in the dairy industry, and the feeling that NFO and the dairy program would be in a, make an attempt to take over the control of the processing of dairy products really was a misunderstanding. Today, I'm sure that's being clarified and there is a better understanding between the managers, the board of directors, the processors in general in the dairy industry. So today, I think with a little background on the history of this, and as I like to say, the misunderstanding, we should go into an explanation of what we've actually accomplished and how we had to take these steps down. Well, of course, NFO has been busily over the past number of years organizing dairy farmers and we've been bargaining and signing master contracts which would be used for future activation. 
think the results of these efforts, of uh, the NFO bargaining efforts, can be seen. We take a little look at uh, a few of the figures. I'll step up to the blackboard here, Ed. Uh, for example, 1962, and these prices, by the way, are actual prices from a large Midwestern grade A milk plant. In 1962, the blend milk price at this plant averaged $3.46. In 1963, the price was $3.48. In 1964, the price was $3.51. And in 1965, the price was $3.55. Over a four-year period of time was a total of a nine-cent increase in the price of milk. Now, about this time, NFO became well enough organized in the dairy industry to begin doing some real effective bargaining. And in 1966, we saw the price go up in this same plant to $4.14 which was an increase of 59 cents. And in 1967, price rose another 20 cents to $4.34. And of course, this year we've seen another increase, which has brought about a total increase of about $1.100 over the last two and a half years. These are efforts that uh, NFO has succeeded in getting to the dairy producers by the use of collective bargaining, both at the producer and at the plant level. This is really what's important when you look at figures like that that you actually can point at and say this is the dollars and cents that have been, that have been gained through the activities and farmers working together. Because I think now let's compare this to something that actually costs us money. Uh, and I like to always point this out to every farmer, every dairy farmer, or if he produces another uh, commodity. We were all in this same position when NFO started and back in the uh, early 50s when they said, get bigger, get more efficient. Uh, we evidently did it. We produced more and we created what they said was a surplus. We got to the point where the surpluses were gone back in the middle 60s, say 66 in there. Then the imports came in on us. The imports were cut back. We got supply and demand in balance. Substitutions were used. All of these things to hold down prices. But look, in two years, when we got enough of this production together. This is the real thing that uh, I think all of us should look at, the price increase that came about when enough farmers got working together and bargaining together to increase the prices. Really, this is the purpose of our dairy program, and it's being effective today with much more increases to come. All it takes, as the letter says, cooperation, among dairymen. Ed, one thing we got to point out also is that when the bargaining did seem to slow up, that NFO had the organization and the courage to use the biggest bargaining weapon of all, and that was the milk holding action in the spring of 1967. This holding action, of course, was the largest organized effort dairy far of dairy farmers in the United States ever. It brought about some real spectacular gains to the NFO dairy producer. This is certainly right, Don. The whole, this brings us up to the holding action. Certainly that's something that did not go unnoticed. I wonder if everyone realizes the benefits from the NFO dairy holding action. Certainly I hear farmers who are unfamiliar with the bargaining efforts, unfamiliar with the NFO program, that say, well, what can you point to? Well, I can point directly to at least seven things accomplished in that dairy holding action. One of the things, I think, of course, was that it, through the sacrifice and the real determined fight that the NFO dairy producers fought in the spring of 1967, that this sold collective bargaining to American agriculture. And this is one thing 
that the dairy producers that participated in this gallant fight have got to take credit for, that they sold collective bargaining to American agriculture. Yes, that's right, Don. I think this is probably one of the most important, selling collective bargaining to agriculture and to the nation in general. This didn't only sell a dairy program, it sold collective bargaining because every other group is now saying collective bargaining where a few years ago it was almost a word that no one liked to hear and some people were even afraid to use. Of course, you spoke before about the uh, better understanding between NFO and the dairy industry. And I think this has come about a great deal since the NFO milk holding action of 1967. Don, I mentioned there are seven different things that were accomplished by the NFO Dairy Holding Action. I'd like to point them out and also show that people in the dairy industry recognize this at the exact time immediately following this holding action. Many people today in the dairy industry say, well, the imports are going to hurt you. Or they say, well, what will you do about the imports? Well, first of all, of course, if you don't organize, you can't do anything about the imports. Not, so very, you've, not very well. Right. You've got to be an NFO member and in a dairy program here to do anything about the imports. But following that holding action, we saw the President of the United States use his emergency powers to cut back on dairy imports. Now, the amazing thing on this is what effect would it would we had had not the president used these powers we had coming into this country in the past year about 5.5 billion pounds equivalent milk equivalent this was reduced to about 1 billion pounds it only takes a small portion of imported products to depress your prices this was absolutely cut back immediately following the holding action. Number two, the emergency federal order hearings that were held. Here's something I hope that everyone can understand, that federal order hearings were asked for by many people in the dairy industry, including NFO. Well, you could get federal order hearings, but there was very little said about price. Immediately following the NFO holding action, emergency federal orders were held. The hearings were held to do something. The seasonal price decline, number three, was eliminated. Here's the dairy record, the Washington newsletter, the dairy industry newsletter. United States Department of Agriculture boosts order prices 20 cents and ends seasonal pricing. It actually cut out the seasonal pricing where you normally have your decrease plus a 20 cent increase given. Point number four. Number five, the dairy industry moving together. Certainly today we're reading of mergers, consolidations, picking up the papers, the farm magazines more than we've ever seen them before. The industry coming together prior to the NFO holding action. Actually, the dairy industry was operating like individual farmers competing against one another. Number six, the support price, of course, today has been raised to 90% of parity on dairy, as high as they legally can go. Why did this happen? Why has it happened just recently? Certainly, the statement that was made by NFO in the past four months, depending upon the gains made by the commodity holding action, and if these gains were being tied down on contracts, NFO would not hesitate to go into another holding action in milk. The support price was raised to the legal limit. And of course, the one point number seven, the one we discussed before, selling collective bargaining.
to the nation, not only to the nation, by means of Telstar, people in foreign countries realized that the farmers of America were doing something, all because of the NFO milk holding action. Few people, I think, really realized the problem that the dairy farmer was in until actually he demonstrated uh, what was happening to him during the holding action. And one thing we do have to point out here, though, is that uh, with these emergency federal order hearings and the price uh, increase that we're talking about, as we can see here, the, uh, the bottom line, of course, represents the price that was spelled out very clearly in the federal orders. This is not a price that we say might have happened. This is a price that indeed was spelled out in the federal orders. And this line, of course, represents the price of milk that the producers would have actually gotten had it not been for the milk holding action. Of course, the top line shows the actual price of class one milk as a result, showing the effects of the milk holding action on class one prices. That's correct, and at this time, following this holding action, when NFO went into the phase two, the second step, you might say, in the holding action, probably the misunderstanding of phase two at that point has caused some problems in some areas that, just again, a misunderstanding, and to clarify that point, Don, I think we ought to go into the phase two portion of this a little bit right now. I think this is a very good idea, Ed. Uh, one thing I think we should point out here right at the start, that the phase two program would not mean a class one or a grade A producer would be required to uh, have his milk processed and, as the old term goes, stored and held. Uh, this, I think, is where a great deal of the misunderstanding uh, came about because of the phase two program. In other words, there's so much more to the phase two program than store and hold. There always was more to phase two right. than store and hold. It was just uh, that our producers or many of our members never became aware of the real power or the real purpose of phase two. Perhaps, Ed, what you should do is, uh, is uh, draw this out for us on the blackboard, and I think we might be able to get a real good, clear idea of exactly the power and the purpose of phase two. All right, Don. Certainly there's a way in agriculture that the consumer gets the product, whether it is dairy, grain, or meat, and it's primarily the same. We must think of selling dairy products, grain, or meat almost through the same channels. It is through the same channels, the retailers, the chain stores. And I believe through this diagram, we can see a little bit more clearly how our production moves through the channels and where it ends up and what we must do to price it. Let's start from the top on this and we will talk of the retailer or the chains in particularly, or let's say exporters. They take some of our products exported into foreign countries, but we've got to get it there and this is where it is being priced today. But let's follow this through and work on this phase two program and see actually what we have. Where do these people get this product? How does it get to them? Let's say here that we'll take the broker that takes our product. Who handles a lot of dairy products that we normally think about? Borden? Certainly. Craft, certainly. Major handlers. Where does it come from to these people? Well, let's say that we've got processors out here. Some of them may be independents. Some of them may be co-ops. This production has to be processed, moving through these channels. The co-ops 
must get this production and the independence from where? Producers, farmers, all over the nation. So now, let's start at the bottom. What could this farmer or this small group of farmers, what could they do to bargain with the co-op or the independent processor or the broker or the chains and the exporters? Really nothing as individuals. A step has to be taken. And I'm drawing out just a few farmers here to show what a few could do in pricing their product. And I want to go to this step where I'm going to draw in a solution to the pricing problem of dairy products and how it can work under the phase two program. Certainly this group of farmers goes to the cooperative with the product or the independent to have it processed. We go through it, but let's go to an unknown group or a group we haven't had until now, NFO. All of these farmers marketing through the independents and the co-ops still coming in to this NFO block of production. Let's for a minute, I mentioned before, how could this farmer, or if you say this represents 10 farmers, how could they bargain with the independent processor, the cooperative, or the broker, or the chain, when the marketing system does this? The broker comes to the co-op and said, I'll give you so much for your product. The Bordens and the Crafts, the large handlers do this, come to the independents and the co-ops as individuals, when there are thousands and thousands of cooperatives and independents out there. Because they are working together, understanding more that they have to do today by the mergers we see, we're moving in a step in the right direction. But now let's take this production, this pr production, all of it, bring it to this block, and what does NFO really mean? It means any time that the market cannot fulfill its needs from outside of NFO, then we become a bargaining factor in the market. At this point, by retaining control through our phase two program, NFO becomes the major bargaining group. Now, you might say, but there are not as many showing here selling into NFO block as you have outside of it. I think, Don, better to show that. I'm going to ask you in just a minute to show the to what the total production means and how this group is the major bargaining group. But to go through it once more, all of us realizing that the chains and the exporters are two of the primary outlets, eventual outlets for all products in agriculture. Dairy, the same as in, in grain or meat. The brokers, the Bordens and the Crafts are the major handlers, handle a tremendous amount of it, but eventually it still goes, most of it, through this group. Our thousands of co-ops and independents where we as producers sell the product or have it processed. All of us are too weak as independents down here, alone, whether we be a, at the co-op level or at the producer level. But bringing this together all over the nation and forming this new organization, the marketing agency in common, being controlled by NFO, this is where the bargaining power is and what eventually happens. The broker or the large handlers can't come to you as an individual. They can only come to this group right here. It's so simple to see that that's what you work for. The commodity must be blocked together 
NFO couldn't bargain for anything if it didn't have the production to use. We have it through the phase two. Don, I'm going to call on you to show again in another graph how effective this group can be. Actually, Ed, what we must point out here also is that to be effective in bargaining, you first must have control of a large enough portion of the total supply. That's right. And of course, what you've pointed out here really shows that we've got a structure that'll make it economically possible to price milk from the farmer level up rather than from the chain store down. Now, with this circle here, perhaps I could show you what we mean by getting enough of the total production together so that we can bargain effectively. Assuming that this circle represents the total production in the United States, and we spoke of the small groups today, that uh, large groups, various amounts of them, that today are bargaining and handling production. We must keep in mind that today one of the largest groups controls only 6% of the total supply Yet, by NFO being able to block together production nationwide, we could come up with a far larger portion of production than any of these existing groups. And at the same time, we must remember that these groups cannot legally bargain together with one another. The answer, of course, lies in the formation of a marketing agency. This, of course, phase two can bring about, all the while, NFO keeping control of a large enough block of production so that we can con continue to have bargaining control, market control in the market. This is right, John. That block represents a major factor in the bargaining or the marketing system today. We're seeing and hearing a lot of the mergers, about the mergers. It looks to me as though the industry today is moving very similar or in the way NFO suggested back in 1961. This is good. We must also point out that the amount of production coming into phase two is increasing rapidly each week. And this, of course, is what's going to determine just how effective NFO is in its bargaining efforts. After all, we must have the production of our members signed on the milk processing and sales agreement before we can legally bargain for their, for their product. This is our goal now, to complete the sign-up. Yes. The dairy program will work, get the production into the phase two portion of the program. Today's program has featured Dairy in Reality with Ed Graff, National Dairy Commodity Director for the National Farmers Organization, and Don Burkon, assistant to the NFO Dairy Commodity Department. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is a gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers.